morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful 11th Sunday after the time of Pentecost. As you watch this, today is the 16th of August. Today, within this week, we have celebrated the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the United States. It took far too long to get that credit, but here we are. And as we worship today, I want you to know that I'm not here. Uh, physically, on this day, August 16th, Colleen, Alice, and I will be in the Sequoias up near Kings Canyon camping, being very socially distant. It'll be a refreshing time, I, I trust, and I give thanks for uh, the gift that you give us to be away at this time. Therefore, today, as I turn worship over in a moment to Richard Phillips, I give thanks for his leadership. I give thanks for the testimony that he's going to bring. You'll note today that he's going to do some of his uh, uh, parts of worship from inside the sanctuary. He's wearing a very special microphone uh, that belongs to a friend of his. Uh, as we continue to acquire the right equipment, to acquire the right talent, and pull that together in timing, uh, we are indeed looking forward to when we can broadcast worship from the sanctuary. Today I give thanks for Elizabeth Conley for a marvelous uh, rendition of the stories of Scripture this day. I give thanks for Russ Hoxie, who has offered a psalm, Psalm 130, in a way that is reflective and poignant and uh, worth seeing over and over again. I give thanks for Paul, Jan, and uh, Bill Engels as they provide music for us. And then especially today for Bishop Taylor, Bishop Andy Taylor, who is uh, sharing the good news with us and shared an interview with me earlier in the week that is part of our worship this morning. On this 11th Sunday after Pentecost, I invite you to be surprised. Be surprised as Samuel was surprised as he attempted to anoint the new king at God's command and found that he was not seeing as God saw. Be surprised. Be surprised as God in the person of Jesus reaches out to one who is whispering murder and threats to the disciples of Jesus and becomes himself one of the greatest disciples that we've ever known. Be surprised when Jesus comes and invites us to see his world, to see creation, to see grace, and to understand what God is up to in a new way. Today is a good day to be surprised. May you be so, surrounded and filled with God's peace. Gathering in spirit at the baptismal pool, let us confess together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope on ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And by your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
So we are blessed today to have uh, Bishop Taylor with us uh, as our preacher. And I want to provide you, Bishop, with the opportunity to greet the people at first and to share a little bit about what's going on in your life now that this COVID shutdown has gone on a little longer than we expected. Hi, First Lutheran. It's good to be here with all of you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Kirk, for inviting me to um, join with you today. Yeah, uh, we did not expect, I certainly did not expect when we shut down in March that we would continue mostly to be at home. Um, I've driven up to my office in Santa Ana from my home in Santee only twice since uh, the middle of March. Uh, our staff, our office staff who live near there, um, rotate to uh, keep the office open, usually only one person at a time. Uh, we want to be very, very safe. Um, I will be going up there um, next week uh, uh, for my third time because I have some things to do up there. But, uh, um, but for right now, I've mostly been working from home, getting very familiar with using Zoom as a platform and Microsoft Teams as a platform to coordinate with folks, uh, learning more technology than I would have thought. And instead of going to churches to preach, going to churches to hear your pastors preach. Uh, I have at least had one time where I uh, saw Pastor Kirk preach at, at First Lutheran, and uh, I've uh, um, seen other pastors preach as well, and it's been good to be at worship with, with all of you. A lot of my job is continuing to, um, to remind people that we have to we have to follow our governors and our and whether we're in hawaii or california our governors and public health officials guidelines for what is safe and that as good public citizens we need to to do what is right uh, i have I had some churches very upset with me that i've said since uh recently since we're in counties where covid 19 cases continue to increase that uh, we are uh, not allowed to worship inside together. Um, I've had some churches unhappy with me about that, but uh, I just feel that's the right thing to do. So that's a lot of my work these days. Okay. You, you have a more global picture of the church and are in conversation with uh, other bishops around the United States. There are some challenges coming up for, for us as a church as we go forward. And some, I think, some really wonderful opportunities. I mean, here we are. I never would have interviewed by Zoom five months ago. It, would, it wouldn't have made sense. But, but here we are, and you can be with us in this way. So are you seeing some, or maybe I should ask, what, what new exciting opportunities do you see for the church? <laughs> well, on. actually, I think it's really interesting. Um, we have a small congregation. I won't tell you where it is. but. Uh, um, they usually worshiped somewhere around 20 people. Uh, they moved online and, and they've been having 200 eyeballs look at them on a, on a regular basis. And, uh, and I think that there is a hunger for church. I, I keep hearing that people um, are seeing those who had left church years ago coming back on Sunday mornings and, um, and viewing church services. Um, I think new people are, are giving a look. Whenever you have something like um, this uh, pandemic, people begin to come face to face with mortality, with questions about why does the world work this way? What, what is God up to? Is there really a God? Does God care? You know, sort of those easy um, answers of, oh, I don't believe in that, or, well, I believe, but you know, it doesn't really matter how my life is uh, lived as a response to that, um, those kind of when, when people get, um, get challenged as this pandemic has challenged us all, people began to look for, um, if not answers, uh, just ways of dealing with their day-to-day -day lives and understanding how God might be at work. And so I think there's an incredible opportunity for the church. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us as church to preach the gospel. The, the unconditional love of Christ Jesus for all of us and what God does to make us God's own, even in the midst of difficult times. You may hear a little bit of that in the sermon that's about to come, but, um, but uh, uh, I just really feel that as long as we're preaching the gospel, there are two things I want every church to do. Preach the gospel, love your neighbors. Um, you at first have dug very deeply into loving your neighbors, particularly your neighbors who are homeless, who are hungry, 
who are in need. And, and um, I just so admire the work that your congregation does in cooperation with TACO and uh, just want to commend you for continuing that work, especially during this time of COVID-19. Um, I think it's really ironic that I, I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead in order to bring us closer together, to break down walls that separate us. Yeah. And this disease has forced us to build up new walls, um, not because we don't want to be together, but just to protect if not our health, the health of our neighbor. And, but I, I've noticed two things that, you know, especially right when the pandemic started, you'd see pictures from around the world of smog-filled skies suddenly clear again because people stopped pouring so much carbon into the air. Mm -hmm. It was happening here in Southern California as well as we drove less. I've certainly been driving much less since all this took place. Um, you just wonder if God's not going to use some of this to try and begin us on a journey of healing our world and finding new ways to heal our world that we might not have occurred to us if we hadn't had to slow down, stop, stay in place, and look for different ways to live our lives. Right. Well, and since your sermon, since you preached it, we've also had um, a new national conversation about uh, relations between different ethnicities, about the treatment of people of color in our society, particularly African Americans, the whole kind of re-emergence in a positive way of Black Lives Matter, uh, and, and conversation about global warming, of course the pandemic. So um, that's all happened. And one of the things I really appreciated, Bishop, about your, your sermon, uh, that everybody's gonna to get to see in a moment, is that it's so gospel-centered, but that that addresses, the gospel does continue to address our human condition today. And you do that over and over again. Every time I've heard you preach or speak, every time you've taken a microphone, you go back to the good news, the evangelical good news of the gospel, and invite us to reach further out with that. Do you have a time, was there a time in your life when that sort of clicked, or is there a, a, a story about the, your, your evangelical uh, fervor <laughs> that, that happened? I think, I think there are a, a few different pieces in that. I, I had a great preaching teacher at Luther Seminary by the name of Dr. Sheldon Tostengard, who really taught us how to preach the gospel and always wanted to hear the gospel ring and reminded us that the way people listen, they, um, they don't always hear the gospel as freeing. They often hear what we say in terms of, um, well, you got to do more. And, and, uh, and so I, I've, ever since I had that first preaching class in 1982, I've always tried to look for where is the gospel, the, the true proclamation of God's unconditional love for us and of why Jesus went to the cross and how that frees us to be God's people um, here and now. But I would say about 10 years ago, I began to realize that um, we are freed more and more for action. Um, I mean, I knew it all along, but I didn't preach it quite that clearly. And so now I tend to say more, um, uh, God is taking care of you. You don't need to worry about yourself so you can, um, look at your neighbor and serve them and um, and trust that God will always be with you. And so that, I think that's all come together. And I think a lot of that happened um, as, um, as I was noticing in about 2010 um, that the church had changed. People weren't coming to church as often as they did in the late 1990s. It was harder to grow congregations. And uh, and that one of the things we all needed to do was stop thinking about the gospel as just being for me and start realizing that it frees me to help to help other people. I think I grew up some at that point. And, uh, and that's just helped me to continue to put that out there. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, I certainly appreciate it. I know we at first love hearing that over and over again. So, well, thank you, Bishop, for your time uh, today uh, to uh, kind of bring uh, the gospel uh, again for this these ancient words <laughs> uh, to make them current and alive today. Thank you uh, for that and your presence uh, in our life together. And uh, we look forward to hearing a marvelous sermon.
So God bless you and your work as you continue to be hunkered down. <laughs> and God bless you and, all, and your whole congregation in your work as you continue to serve your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to everyone. It's been a long time since I've seen you, since you've seen me, and I've missed everybody terribly. Can't wait till we can get back together again. It shouldn't be too much longer, I hope. I'm going to start by telling you how I'm going to present the lessons this morning. When I was teaching elementary school in Dayton, Ohio, I had remedial reading classes, grades one through eight, and the students would come to me one class at a time. They would read to me on Mondays through Thursdays, and on Fridays I would read a story to them. So I'm going to tell you a story today. It's from the Bible. It's from 1 Samuel, chapter 16. And people are looking for a king. And I'm not going to tell you who gets to be king. You'll have to listen to the story and see if you can guess who it is. Some of you will know already. Some of you will guess during the reading but you, you all will get the lesson and the name at the end of the reading. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, but how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I named to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet in trembling and said, Do you come peacefully? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elab and thought, surely the Lord's anointing is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on this appearance, on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see us mortals as we see mortals. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Well, then Jesse made Shema pass and said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. 
Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? And Jesse said, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes. And he was handsome too. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And in the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. <laughs> From that day forward, Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark inequities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its inequities. The second lesson is from Acts, chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And went to a high priest and asked him for letters from the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? And Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up 
and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and through his eyes, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight. He neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in the vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for the man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in the vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your servants in Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the ninth chapter. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to be here with you today. This is the second sermon I have prepared for the Synod, but this sermon's a little different from the one I prepared previously. That sermon was the sermon for the second Sunday of Easter. This sermon is to be used any time in the remaining Easter season in the month of May, which is why I'm wearing white today, or you could use it during the green season, during Pentecost, whatever will work for your pastor and for your church. I once again am grateful to the people of Claremont Lutheran Church, to Pastor John Doolittle for opening the sanctuary for me to record the sermon, and to a member of Claremont, Eddie McCoven, for being our video recorder and sound man. It's a real great help to have him helping us do this. I don't know about you, but it's been a while since I've had my hair cut. I, um, my hair is looking shaggier and bushier than it has at any other time. I managed during the day to put it down with hair gel and uh, hair paste, but boy, in the middle of the night when I wake up, it can look crazy. The other night I woke up and looked in the mirror and thought to myself, I recognize that hair. That's my hair from the 70s. 
back at a time when we all kept it longer and unkempt and uncombed. And so I thought, I need to see this in the light. So I turned on the light, put on my glasses, and realized that was not my hair from the 70s. It was not nearly as cool looking, and it had flecks of gray, and underneath it were wrinkles of a man who was closer to his 70s in age than he was back in the 1970s when he was a teenager and in his young 20s. No, it was a very different kind of hair, and it's amazing as I looked at that to think how I thought I saw something from the past, only to realize that times had changed, and I had changed, and it was time to move on. Times have changed for the people of Israel since the death and resurrection of Jesus. Times have changed for Jesus' followers, and little did he know it, but times were changing for a man named Saul. Who was Saul? Saul was a devout, faithful Jew, a worshiper of God, and one who studied the biblical law so much that he thought it was important to keep that law in its purity. And he was enraged by heresies when they arose among the people. And a new heresy, he thought, had arisen. Certain followers of Jesus were saying that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior God had promised from of old. But Saul looked around him and thought, the world hasn't changed. How can Jesus be the Savior? This must be a lie. And so he did everything he could to stomp out what he considered to be a false narrative. He had even gotten letters from the chief priests to go up to Damascus in Syria, north of of Judea, north of Israel, north of Galilee, and go to the synagogues there and take away anyone who was spreading the word of Jesus so they could stop this word from spreading any further. But while he was on the road, he suddenly realized that his life was about to change forever. A light flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and suddenly he heard a voice. He heard that voice say, Saul, Saul, Why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? And the worst possible message came back. I am Jesus, the very one you are persecuting. I am real, and I am alive, and I am here. But get up and go into the town, and you will learn there what you are to do. And when Saul got up, he suddenly could not see a temporary physical blindness that mirrored the spiritual blindness that had guided his life for a period of at least a few weeks, maybe months. He got up and was led into Damascus, and there he awaited to see, if you will, what the Lord had in mind. In Damascus was another man named Ananias, who certainly did not want to see what God would have him do. God appeared to Ananias in a vision and said, I have work for you. And Ananias said, okay, Lord, what is it? And the Lord said, I want you to go to this guy named Saul. He's staying here in town, and I want you to lay hands on him so that he may receive his sight. And Ananias says, "Um, God, I'm not sure you're all that well acquainted with this Saul guy. He's not a good person. He's here to arrest people like me, to drag us out of here. Why would I go voluntarily to be with him? But God says, no, Ananias, go to him. You do not see what I see. You do not know what I know I am about to do. I ask you to trust me in faith and go and lay your hands on him. And then your eyes will be opened and you will see what I will do through him for the sake of the world. You know, Ananias isn't the first person to argue with God and to say to God, you've got it wrong. Or to say to God, I think you're going the wrong way. He's certainly not the first person to be blind to what God may be doing in this world. I want to tell you about Cassie. Cassie came to church one day. She was a faithful member of church, was in her women's group, was always there to serve meals at funerals, was part of the quilters, was regularly in Bible study, and every Sunday you could find her in her place, in her pew at church, unless some visitor got there, in which case she sat as close to them as she possibly could, which would have been a hard thing in this day of physically distancing that we're living in today. Cassie came up to her pastor, Pastor Jerry, and she said, Pastor, this is my last day in church. 
I'm not coming here anymore because I've decided it doesn't matter if I'm here or not. God doesn't listen to my prayers. Pastor Jerry said, what happened, Cassie? Cassie said, I've been praying for the last two years for my daughter Kay. She got involved with this guy. He got her hooked on drugs, and I've been praying daily, hourly, that she will get off of drugs and get into a better life, but things have just gotten worse and worse. A month ago, she was arrested for dealing drugs, and she met with her lawyer a couple of weeks ago and heard that the best she could get was five years in jail with maybe a couple years off early release for good behavior while she's there. And I've been praying and praying that she would be released from this, that she wouldn't have to go through this, that she would get off drugs and amend her life. But yesterday, or rather Friday, was the sentencing, and they took her away five years in prison. I prayed and prayed about this pastor, and God didn't listen to my prayers. So I've decided there must not be a God. Or if there is a God, that God doesn't listen to anybody like me. And so why should I be here for God? So I'm leaving, and I'm not coming back. And that was the last time that Jerry saw Cassie for a long, long time. Cassie's not the only person to think, God isn't listening to me. Have you ever felt that way yourself? Ever prayed and prayed for something and not known what's going on? Ever thought during this time of pandemic, where are you, Lord? Why aren't you helping the people who are sick? Why aren't you helping nations throughout the world care for people who have this horrible illness? What are you doing? Why aren't you hearing our prayers? Maybe you've been among those who have been blind or seemingly unable to see God at work and active in the world the way it is. If so, you are not alone. There are many people in the Bible who would identify with you. I can think of 11 off the top of my head. The 11 disciples of Jesus who, after Judas betrayed him, saw Jesus taken to the cross and wondered, what in the world is God doing? We thought Jesus was the Savior of Israel. We thought that this was who God really was. God was one who worked through Jesus to preach good news to the poor, who healed the sick and fed the hungry and was with us in ways that we didn't know God would be with us. We thought this was the Savior of the world, only now he's dead and all our hopes and dreams are dashed. Those disciples on that Friday and Saturday just couldn't see what God was up to. Yet on that Sunday, their eyes began to be opened. As Jesus rose from the dead, appeared first to the women disciples, and then appeared to the men, and then began to appear to a bunch more, finally to Saul himself on the road to Damascus. And slowly, one by one, two by two, group by group, person by person, their eyes were opened, and they saw Jesus, and saw Jesus for who he is, one who was there with him, and who would never leave. A few weeks after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus met with those disciples on a mountain in Galilee. And he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Ever since that time, followers of Jesus have lived by that promise. I am with you always to the end of the age. We don't always see Jesus, but Jesus is always there. Jesus is there with us in this time of pandemic. Jesus is there with us in our times of being physically distant from others that we would love to be with in person. Jesus is there in our homes. Jesus is there wherever we go. Jesus is in our hospitals. Jesus is with those who are dying. And if even death were to take us, Jesus would still be there to bring us from death to life. Jesus is there with you this day. And if you don't see it, that's okay. Because the promise is not dependent on our being able to see it. It's dependent on Jesus who promises to be with us. And we can be assured that in this life, even when we don't see it, God is still at work in and with us. And that at times we get glimpses of how Jesus is there with us. 
Ananias got a glimpse of Jesus being with him. As Saul immediately was not only baptized, but began to proclaim the good news of Jesus there in Damascus, uniquely gifted by his training in the law to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Saul saw it in in Jesus, who appeared to him on the road, who appeared to him through the work of Ananias, who helped him receive the Holy Spirit, and then went out to preach. And through Saul, who we better know as Paul, who wrote many, many of the letters in our New Testament, that Paul, we know more through him about Jesus than we would know if he hadn't written and hadn't taught us for centuries through this Holy Scriptures. And for Cassie, even for her, there was a time where she caught a glimpse of Jesus as well. About a year after she had left that church, she didn't go to anything, not to Bible study, not to quilters. Her friends would check in on her from time to time, and she was open to them, but she told them she no longer believed and she wasn't going to church. Until one day she showed up, and Pastor Jerry said, Cassie, it's so good to see you. And Cassie said, well, I need to tell you why I'm here, Pastor. I was just to see Kay in prison the other day. She hadn't wanted me to visit her for most of this first year, but we wrote letters to each other, and finally she said, Mom, I'd really like it if you were to come. And when I came and saw her, she said, Mom, I'm off drugs completely. I'm in recovery. I'm getting my life back together. I'm starting it here in prison, and I need you to pray for me. And Cassie said, I said to her, I don't pray anymore, Kay. And Kay said, Mom, I'm depending on your prayers. I need you to pray for me more than ever. You've been praying for a long time that I be drug-free, right? And she said, yeah. Well, now I finally am. And now I need your prayers more than ever. Please pray for me. And Cassie came to Pastor Jerry and said, you know, God was at work at Kay. God was at work in ways that I couldn't see. My prayers are being answered, just not in my time. And Kay says she needs my prayers more than ever. I got to think that maybe she's right. And maybe God needs me to keep on praying. So I'm back, Pastor Jerry. I'm here to volunteer for whatever you need. I'm back in church. And I'm going to keep my eyes open and see how God may still be at work in ways that I'm not seeing in Kay's life and the lives of others in our church. The truth is that God is with us in ways that we cannot always see. This world is going to change, I think, because of this pandemic. We will be changed. There will be parts of us that look kind of the same, like my hair sort of resembled my hair from the 70s the other night. But we'll turn on the lights and put on the glasses and look more closely and see, oh, we've been shaped and molded. We are different than we were before. But that does not mean bad things will happen. We will learn, as I have seen you, good congregations of Pacific Synod, continuing to learn of new ways that God is with you, of new ways that God is reaching out through you, of new ways that your hope is renewed and restored by the God who continues relentlessly to be with you because God has promised to be with you and God will never leave you. That God is with you this day and always. And even though we and the world may change, we will still have God with us. And God will help us to live through those changes, celebrate them, find the good in them, and see God continually being at work. Good people, bless you in this time of pandemic. God, strengthen you to do the work that you need to do. God, grant you all that you need physically emotionally, financially, spiritually, to get through this time. But always, always remember the promise. God is with you, no matter what. And God will be with you this day, tomorrow, and always. In the name of God, our Maker, of Christ, who died on the cross for us, and the Holy Spirit, who sanctifies us and fills us with God's grace. Amen.
trusting God's promise of new life. We pray for the renewal of the church, the world, and all of creation. You call your disciples to follow the way of the cross by their words and works of love. Open the eyes of your church so that it might be a place of welcome and respect for all people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Every creature in heaven and on earth sings your praise. Give us deep appreciation for the vibrant diversity of creation, flowers and streams, animals and bugs, sunsets and stormy skies. Help us to conserve the beauty around us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Come to the aid of those who are persecuted, oppressed, or imprisoned here in our community, in our state, in this nation, and abroad. Walk with all refugees and immigrants as they seek safe homes. Raise up leaders who are generous and hospitable. We give you thanks this day for the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, the right to vote. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Bring relief to bodies weary with pain or sickness. Bless doctors, nurses, hospice workers, home health care providers, therapists, social workers, and all caregivers who demonstrate your love in acts of healing and tenderness, especially in these days of pandemic. We pray also and especially for our African American and Latinx brothers and sisters who continue to suffer the brunt of this disease. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You feed us at your holy table, and then you send us out to feed others. Bless those who fish and bake and cook, those who serve, our grocery store workers and food pantry volunteers, especially those who provide for those here at First Lutheran and Taco. Open our eyes to your grace, that it might be present in every meal that we share. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. All honor and glory and blessing belong to you. We praise you for the faith of the saints. Be near us as we await the day when we will feast with the risen Christ forever. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. And now we commend these and all our prayers to you, O God. Come near to us with your saving help. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Please join me now as we profess together our common faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son or Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I have always liked the offertory prayer from the LBW, and now a revised version in the ELW that reads, We offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. It reminds me that who I am, what I am, and all that I have are provided as gifts from God. Over the past 12 months, I and a few other members have been serving on a task force, examining the financial resources and trends that support the ministry of First Lutheran Church. The objective of the task force is to develop recommended financial strategies to support and expand the ministry of First Lutheran. I'm sure it's not news 
But like many organizations, revenues are down during these unusual times. During this pandemic experience, we are unable to meet together for corporate worship and to receive the sacrament, to provide hospitality to each other and others who visit our worship service. Various support groups that use the church's facilities are not meeting, and some weekday parking spaces are left unrented. These revenue sources help provide financial support for the ministry and ongoing operations of First Lutheran Church. But the doors of First Lutheran Church are not closed. I periodically stop by the church to do small, small projects or drop something off, and the church is always active. People are in and out of the kitchen preparing meals for distribution. Housed and unhoused neighbors are knocking at the door, seeking something to eat, to pick up their mail, to use the restrooms upstairs, or to just rest in the courtyard from the daytime heat. As I've said many times in the past, First Lutheran Church is a busy place. These challenging times have also provided new opportunities, an opportunity to experience new ways to worship together online, to obtain news and through e-blasts and newsletters, to connect through Facebook, Zoom, and other social media. It also provides an opportunity to support the ministry of First Lutheran through electronic giving. Faithful members and friends have embraced online giving, whether through reoccurring gifts or one-time donations. In fact, the number of households that provide regular ongoing electronic giving has more than doubled since March of this year. Over 80% of the revenues that support the ministry of First Lutheran Church come from regular giving and one-time contributions. Thank you, good and generous servants. I invite, encourage you as you are able to support our ministry together here through online giving. A link can be found in the electronic worship bulletin or the church's website. As St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, you will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. Please join in the offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you have taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sustain you, encourage you, enable you to experience God's gospel and grace, and so fill you with God's presence that you can't help but reach out with God's love to one another, to your community, and to the world. Go in God's grace, share the good news.